So Vic, first of all, absolutely congratulations on your walk for 100 Women Squared Women Helping Women. What an extraordinary achievement. Thank you, Mary. It was just a wonderful experience in so many unexpected ways. Tell me more about that. Well, first of all, I was, I found it, I was nervous about raising funds. I suppose asking people to donate to something is something that many people are probably a bit nervous about. And this time, I decided not to let that get in my way. And the fact that so many people did donate, you know, I had donations from $5 to $1,000 in size. And I found every donation, I feel quite moved talking about it, really quite moving. So that was unexpected. And there were a number of themes that unfolded while I was walking and a number of insights, both into myself as well as what comes about through what was a very intentional 30 days that surprised me. So all of that was unexpected and hugely enriching. Just then when you were speaking about the donations from $5 to $1,000, uh, both of us welled up. Just the, uh, you know, what it's like to know that other people are really supporting you and the cause. So maybe we talk a bit about the cause and then I'd love to know about the insights that you had both personally, but also about the intentionality of your walking. So why did you choose to walk for Buy a Brick campaign for Hobart Women's Shelter? Right, so... I'm an architect. I've been in practice since 1980. And right from the start, when I started practicing in South Africa, where I'm from, my passion is about the sort of social enabling that architecture does or does allow or actually inhibits. So I'm fascinated by how people use space, but also how built space actually allows people to use it. So that social side of architecture has meant that inevitably I've been committed to building community, committed to improving people's lot. In South Africa, I worked on actually a number of new towns established this was under apartheid South Africa in homelands. And these were people, the people who were going to settle there were forcibly removed wow. from their communities. Wow. So apartheid South Africa, politically motivated disruption of people's lives and their communities, their livelihoods, all of that. And while I had mixed feelings about doing that sort of work, I felt that it was really important to be able to help people, mainly through the urban design, to actually re-establish community mm -hmm. and a sense of place. So that and studies that I did, it's always been my passion. Mm -hmm. And then when I came to Australia, my husband and I, we started our practice here in Hobart and inevitably because of that background in social housing, our first breakthrough was actually winning a Tasmania-wide competition for social housing in the centre of Hobart. And we developed and have often repeated, I suppose, the notion of a language of community. Fast forward to 30 years later, and as a woman in my mid-60s now, I just... Uh, as I read about the housing crisis mm -hmm. in Australia, in Tasmania, I thought, well, there but by the grace of God go I. Yes. You know, we had incredible good fortune when we arrived with, look, we were down to our last $300 when we arrived in Tasmania. And over the years, we've worked really hard, but also had just the gift of good luck to be able to get into the housing market. Yes. Good luck in the sense that we had friends who very kindly 
loaned us enough money to in turn raise a loan with a bank to build our first home. Yeah. And it just appalls me that women are yeah. later on in life who've led good lives, yeah. who've done their very best, can find themselves through circumstance, forced out of their homes or unable to afford a home. And so that was the reason why when you invited me to walk and to support a cause that I felt passionate about, I didn't hesitate to, I knew immediately that Hobart Women's Shelter was what I wanted to raise money for. Mm. There was a post that you did when you were walking where you just talked about how frightened you'd be if that was you. And I know for me that post made me sit with the experience of what if that was me, which definitely I felt so much fear that definitely helped me then do the next bit that I needed to do to make sure that you were really well supported and loved mm. as you were walking mm. Mm. for for the Buy a Brick campaign for Hobart Women's Shelter. So as you were walking, you said you had some internal revelations as well. Mm, Do you mm. want to share a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So I decided that I would only count the distance that I walked that was intentionally focused on Hobart Women's Shelter and women in who needed crisis accommodation. And I decided to spread the 100 kilometers to give myself 30 days to do it. So that it meant that over 30 days, every single morning while I walked, I, it was like a walking meditation on women in crisis who weren't, didn't have the security of homes, a house to live in. And a little way into the walk, we had an unexpected pretty extreme weather event which was just a huge amount of rain and wind over uh, I think two days and a night yeah, that yeah. Was cold. and it was cold because I was walking it was May it was autumn it was just a real beginning of a turning mm -hmm. point and what I was doing was taking photographs and I found that I was telling the story of my walking. I, I love writing, I love photographing, and I've learned through previous advocacy work to get over my inhibitions with social media. So it was almost a diary that I was keeping about this intentional walking on Instagram. But in order to do that, I needed to find images. And I was sitting in the car in this pouring rain driving home in the dark from work and I took a few photographs inside the car you know I thought oh this really isn't doing it. someone who hasn't got shelter isn't going to be sitting in a traffic jam in their car with windscreen wipers going they're going to be parked somewhere trying to cope with this rain if they're even lucky enough to have a car and so I thought well where would I park where would I park and so I actually went down to a parking area at a local sailing club. And then I thought, well, would I park under the street lamp or would I park in the dark? And I thought, no, I would park under the street lamp. So I went and I parked there and I was just kind of writing in the mist on the window and thinking about what it must be like, you know. Because I went to a place where there was also a public toilet nearby. Because, you you know, how do you cope with yes. all of that? And then I thought, oh, I just realised how exposed I felt yeah. in the light. Yeah. And so whether you are exposed by parking under the light or whether you're exposed by parking in the dark, it was, I just, look, I'm not pretending to imagine yeah. that I felt the equivalent of what someone must when they that desperate but it gave me a little insight mm -hmm. so these were insights that I had into the vulnerability of mm -hmm. someone who was having to make that terrible decision do they leave a situation often of domestic violence mm -hmm. because they've reached a point where they or 
their family are, they believe they're in such danger that they can no longer stay in their home. When the option is to be in a tent or a car, if they're that lucky, which is, you know, also has its dangers. Wow. Again, that I remember reading a post or maybe we were chatting with each other about that experience and first thing I did was really, I honour you for even dipping your toe into that experience to deepen your own intentionality about why you're walking mm. and in the process helping educate all of us both about our privilege but also increase our awareness which is another part of 100 Women Squared Women Helping Women increasing our awareness about issues that are directly affecting women and of course actually affecting men and their children, all of us. Our whole society and what I realised was that it becomes an intergenerational issue. The ripple effects yeah. are just, they go on and on and on because sitting in that car and imagining a family there, the children aren't going to be able to, well, do you pay for the rego and the petrol or do you pay for the food? How do you cope with homework? How do you get the children to school? So education is going to be impacted. Yes. Mental illness is going to be a huge factor and so on and so forth. And so that other insight was just how the repercussions mm. just continue for years. Yeah, for years, for generations. Yes. Wow, what amazing insights. Any other insights for you really personally, you know, as you're walking? Personally, I am a, I tend to be a project-driven person. I would say that I tend to, at times, lack a bit of discipline. <laughs> it gave me a real discipline to, I had to find ways of fitting the walking into my day. And I realized that actually I, you know, it gave me such joy to be putting myself out there. When one gives, in fact, the giver receives one could argue more than who one's giving to the cause that one's giving to on so many levels mm -hmm. so it's the first time I've really put myself out there in order to reach a target to fundraise in an intentional way and at first I thought oh it's going to be oh a little bit tricky to post every single day but then I actually found this out well, actually, I'm passionate about it, and this is advocacy. And I was always sure to basically just make it an invitation. I always said, if you feel moved to give, then do so. So it was really clear that this was my journey. So it was a journey, a physical journey, and I loved exploring at the pace of being on my feet. I loved just the observation of details about really homemaking that I that I saw as I walked through the city. I revisited at one stage I walked from South Hobart into town past the first home that we built and you know that was just lovely. So there were all kinds of insights it worked on many different levels. Yes. I think we all loved your posts. You know, I'd look every morning to see, you know, what your next post was. And not only because of the beautiful photos, but also because of the intelligent, well-articulated writing that you were doing that both helped share your journey. As you said, it was like a diary. And yet the diary was also incredibly insightful from the lens of an architect you know as well so some of those posts were just gorgeous mm -hmm. and that just brings into mind I've still got the picture now of that rose that you did do you want to share the audience about the rose post well the rose I was on that walk from through South Hobart into town and alert to taking a photograph that would be great and I didn't really know what I was going to talk about I just came across, a, you know, South Hobart has a mix of heritage and there was a lovely picturesque thing, but with this rose in bloom. Mm -hmm. And 
I believe that it's a peace rose. And so I photographed that and posted that and it basically, you know, whether it is, was or wasn't a peace rose, that was what it was to me. And it just captured for me, I guess what I wish the world could become and what we're actually all walking for, which is for peace, for people to be able to live in peace, for them to have peace of mind, for them to have the basic rights of living in harmony. And, you know, the most shocking thing for me about contemplating homelessness in Tasmania and Australia is that we are such a wealthy country. We are so wealthy. No one, there is no excuse for anyone to be without a home. There really isn't. I think I found that I'm profoundly shocked to the core that people are not housed. And that Peace Rose just, it just really captured the vision that I was walking for.